You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, Betty Swords, the little bits of history that don't quite fit in anywhere else. And I'm your host, Katie Charlewood, history harlot and reader of books. Now, a few weeks ago, I did touch on the mysterious death of Lord Darnley. So this is Henry Stuart, the King Consort of Scotland. And he is the second husband of three to Mary, Queen of Scots, Mary Stuart. Now you're thinking, wow, they they have the same surname and she's the Queen, so she shouldn't take his surname Well, you're correct in that, uh, gentle listener, you are. So, they were cousins. I I know you're not surprised because this this is royal people. This is? Those are royal people in, you know, the Middle Ages. So, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be related. And that's the thing about royalty is they had this weird obsession with keeping the bloodlines pure. I mean, that's not the case in this case, but... For a lot of it, it's like, we need to keep the bloodlines pure, which is how these family trees end up turning into a wreath. So this this has continued for a long time, even up until at least the 20th century, but maybe more depending on, on stuff. But yeah, yeah. So Henry Stewart, right, he's a couple years younger than Mary and Because both on his mother's side and his father's side, he had connection to, like, the crown, right? So he was in the line of succession. He was pretty far down it, but he was in it. And he was raised, you know, knowing this and believing, you know, I know this is probably hard for you to believe, but he grew up believing that the world owed him a living, this rich nobleman was convinced and trained and conditioned to believe that he was the sun and the earth revolved around him and that he was deserving of the crown and the throne. And so he was raised in that manner. And so when he was like 13 he gets sent over to Mary, who's in France, right? She's she's marrying the Dauphin. And he goes over, because his parents are currently residing in England, so they're English subjects, and they don't have their lands in Scotland. And they want their lands in Scotland, so they send their teenage son over there to kind of try and, well, cajole Mary into either letting them have their land, or at the very least putting him in Mary's sights because it's no secret that Francis, the Dauphin, he is not a well boy. He's sickly, he's frail, he's shorter than Mary. Like Mary is 5'11". She's very tall, even for then. I think she's the same height as Taylor Swift. You know what I mean? She's, She's a tall lady and he's a good bit smaller than her. But, you know, they they were friends. They were close, you know. They weren't exactly the zestiest of relationships, but they were. And when Frances becomes king, she becomes the Queen of France. So she's the Queen of both France and Scotland. And she was always kind of brought up herself to believe that she was, you know, going to be a, a queen consort. So even though she, you know, was the ruler of Scotland since she was like a few days old, she kind of, she always expected to do so with a husband by her side. And she expected to rule, like co-rule with Francis. Like that was how she was brought up. That's what she was expecting. Anyway, uh, not long after they're married and he becomes the king, he falls ill and dies. And Mary goes into the 40 days of mourning which is just the done thing. She has to officially basically lock herself away and mourn. And as she comes out at those 40 days, 
who shows up but Lord Darnley. So he shows up to show his condolences to Mary and offer her, well, you know, his consideration. See, she's single now, effectively. I mean, she's a widow, but she's single. And that means that he has an in. And so he is showing himself off because he wants to catch her attention. So he does that, right? And he's six foot, he's handsome, he's charming, and he's just kind of around. But he can't do anything yet anyway because they have to make sure that she isn't currently pregnant with the future King of France, right? So, turns out she's not, and after a while she gets sent back to Scotland. And when she's there, she tries to find her own husband, like she tries to marry, I think, the Prince of Spain? But the King of Spain basically vetoes it. He's like, nope, not happening, Uh uh-uh. Because she's Catholic, and she wants to make like another Catholic alliance. So it gets to the point where Queen Elizabeth, she generally approves of Lord Darnley sort of making his making his step in, right? Because he's an English subject, so she feels like she has power over him, right? And he's he's noble, but he's not like very noble. He's not a king. He doesn't have massive power. And so this is quite comforting to Elizabeth because she is consistently paranoid that someone's going to take her throne. And she knows that because she's Protestant and because Mary's Catholic, there are people who want her on the throne. They're going to want her to take her place. And she knows this. And so initially she's she's quite supportive of, of their, you know, communication. So her and Henry, they're courting and whatnot, and they are causing just a scene because they're partying and dancing and doing sort of like fun stuff at court. And he is very charming and he's wooing her. And how do I put this? Uh, like she refers to him as being like one of the lustiest like men. Like he's so lusty, right? Which I'm not surprised at because her first husband was a frail, sick youngin. Like he was inexperienced and, you know, unwell and it was consistent, right? But this is a strong, virile, exciting, charming man. He can hunt with her and horse ride and dance and they can chat and they're having the best time. And, um, yeah, so yeah, he's definitely, you know, <laughs> he's definitely a horny fella. Because he's like 19 as well. He's a teenager. Like, teenage teenage boys are some of the just, I don't know, randiest, like, humans in existence. I mean, they're just so full of hormones. But yeah, when they do get married, like, this pisses Elizabeth off so much because they didn't ask her permission. Because Darnley is a subject of hers and she's like, so fucking pissed off she wants to put him in prison but like he's married to the queen of scotland so that ain't happening so they have a couple months where things are okay but it's it's not okay because he's he's christian right the women they're both christian they're all christian but like he's catholic like she is like he was raised catholic but he wasn't like a practicing catholic well he kind of was basically he he did whatever religion worked for him at the time. So whichever one was popular, he wasn't so much religious as he would like go to like a Protestant like mass and then he'd go to like a Catholic mass to sort of appease like the lords and stuff because there was a reformation in Scotland and so you had these Protestant lords and these Catholic lords and it was just a lot of back and forth and bullshit and tomfuckery, right? Consistent. So... A few months go by and things, things are not going well. So this, um, this honeymoon period is clearly over because he is fucking pissed, right? He's mad because Mary isn't allowing him to have the crown matrimonial. And if you remember from the Mary Queen of Scots episode a few weeks ago, the whole thing about the crown matrimonial was that he would 
become king and have all kingly powers if Mary died. Which, I don't know about you, but if someone is pushing for that, like, at the very beginning of your marriage, that, to me, is kind of a red flag. I want all the stuff in case you die. New, young wife. Bit of a red flag. Just saying. So, things are going badly. He is out at brothels. He's shagging his way around Edinburgh. Like, he is out in the town, right? And their marriage is is kind of on the rocks. But she's Catholic, so that is a whole issue. So, it gets to the point where, you know, something happens, they reconcile at least once, right? They're both relatively young, hormones, I assume, and they do end up shagging enough that she becomes pregnant. And so she is pregnant with James, who's going to be, like, the next King of Scotland. So, and when she's pregnant throughout this time, you know, she's still doing all her stuff, and she is doing so much more work, because he... He wants to be a king, but he's doing absolutely nothing. Like, he's not performing any duties. He's shirking all his responsibilities, right? Because, again, he's just too busy drinking and partying and shagging. And so, like, like a bunch of stuff would end up being delayed. So if they needed the king's signature on something, like, they would have to wait for him to be ready. And he just wouldn't show up to shit. So it got to the point where Mary actually gets a stamp made of his signature because he was just consistently inconsistent so that she could just stamp him on and so that shit would get done. And so she's pregnant and she is still ruling the country, right? And he is an aggressively bitter and paranoid man. And he starts getting really jealous that she is spending all of her time with her private secretary, David Rizzio. And Rizzio is, he's hes Catholic too. He's Italian and he's Catholic. And he's her private secretary. So shocking. They do spend a lot of time together. And you know what? If you were actually doing your bit as king, you'd probably see him a lot too. So he starts spreading a rumour, right? He, and whatever, I don't know who thought this was a good idea, Clearly, adolescent men should not be making world-changing decisions. Like, he starts a rumour that Mary's baby is actually David Rizzio's. Like, he's convinced himself of it, basically. And he is pissed. He's mad he doesn't have her attention. He's mad he doesn't have any power. And he lashes out, as one expects him to, in a fucking batshit way. So he ends up conspiring with a bunch of Protestant lords who cajole him and convince him and say, well, you know what? We will help you get power. We will will make you our king, right? If we get rid of, you know, the Catholic threat in the country. And so what they do is when Mary is having supper with David Rizzio, they enter her quarters... And her loving husband comes up to her, wraps his arms around her waist and he is followed by several Protestant lords who grab David Rizzio and stab him. And shit is flying about this room. Mary almost gets hit by a chair. And Lord Darnley, Henry Stuart, doesn't fucking flinch. It's like he doesn't care, right? So what happens is... She's like seven months pregnant at the time or eight months. She's very, very pregnant at this point. And an act like this happening in front of her, they knew that a big shock could cause an issue with birth, an issue with pregnancy, and that this could be very harmful for Mary and the baby. Like, they know this. Like, we we like to think that people in the past didn't have certain knowledge, but like, there was a few things they knew and this was one of them. So they stab this man, David Rizzio, in front of the Queen, her best friend, her secretary, right? Then they drag him out and stab him 56 times, leaving the King's dabber in his chest. Dabber? No. The King's dagger in his chest as a warning. A dabber. 
a dabber. Oh yeah, yeah, a bunch of Protestant lords, a bunch of Scottish noblemen just fucking dabbed after stabbing a man in the chest. That's exactly what happened. Yep, yep. No, no, the king's dagger was just thrust into the chest of the very dead David Rizzio. And Mary was then held captive. Like, some people try to argue, you know, let's just be a bit more careful, wait until after the birth of the baby and then do the shit. But no, 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 that wasn't happening. So within a couple days, Darnley becomes very aware that the Protestant lords had absolutely, absolutely no intention of making him their king. Like, he is, he is made aware um, by their words and their actions. Like, it's not exactly a secret, but yeah, they don't respect him and he knows it now. He knows he's not going to be their king. He knows that they were just using him to get to the queen. And so he he decides to switch sides and get back with Mary because he knows which side his bread is buttered. So he tries to do that and he manages to convince a few people to get involved and Mary pretends to go into labour. And so they do this, they escape because they're like, we need the guards to leave the room so that she can she can have, you know, a safe birth. Somebody fetch the doctors and stuff. And then they just fucking leg it out of there. And they get on a horse. We're getting horses. And they gently canter away. Like, so they don't want to make it like a loud noise and make it clear that they're escaping. But they, but they escape. Long story short, they end up exiling some Protestant lords and Mary takes her place back as the queen, right? And then she goes into actual labour and gives birth to... James. And it is after this point that that Mary's lords and Mary try to work some stuff out. So for Mary, she needs she needs Darnley to confirm his parentage. She needs him to confirm that he's the dad because like her child needs to be legitimate because her honor has honor, you know, this line of succession you know, it, it can't be fucked with, right? So they need him to come and say it and prove it. So he comes in, he announces that this is his son and everything. And once he makes his big public declaration, she's like, okay, bye. You need to go away now. I can't be dealing with you, right? And so he does, he leaves. And so her and her advisors, they all meet to try and deal with the Darnley problem. Because he's, he's not, he's not great and because he is this privileged piece of shit who had temper tantrums whenever things didn't go his way I mean very extreme very extreme he also you know he accused Mary of having an affair like he started rumors about her knowing that this could destroy everything and he did it anyway and the advisors are trying to like sort out the Darnley problem and he's well, he's, he's, he's just shitty. But they're Catholic. And so they needed to try and get either him to, to, like, try and divorce her. Or he would have to just, like, disappear. But on the how or why, that wasn't quite discussed. But the thing is, being a part of a royal family might seem enticing. But more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow even the royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts.
You can binge even the Royals ad free right now on Wondery Plus. Darnley threatened, you know, that to say that James wasn't his. Like he threatened that. And of course, that's a big fucking issue for Scottish nobility. They can't be having that. He's not involved in any of the state's affairs. Like she's got the stamp with a signature because like, I mean, that's beyond lazy. And so she has this meeting at Craig Miller Castle with her lords to try and figure out what to do, right? So, but she sent him away. She sent him away. And then it turns out that he's ill. And she's like, okay, okay, he's ill. Turns out what he's ill from is syphilis. So there's every possibility that he could have given this to Mary. I mean, we don't think he did because of her health. But there's every possibility this could have happened. So here's here's the thing. He's staying at his dad's and then he's moved to the Kirka Field, right? It's... Uh, and he's staying in the old provost's house. And he's there because Mary went and got him from Glasgow. Like, she actually went and collected him from his dad's and brought him back. And so she's got him staying there, like bang smack in the middle of Edinburgh. And she was supposed to stay there at night because, like, her and Margaret Beaton, they would, like, play music and sing there at night. But then, that night, uh, she was supposed to be staying there. But then she realised that she had a wedding to go to. She went to the wedding of a servant. Can you... Yeah! Yeah, can you imagine? I would love to be the interviewer, like, the inspector trying to, like, interrogate Mary... I was like, oh yeah, I was at a, I was at the <laughs> wedding of a servant, which is totally something a queen would do, by the way. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So she ends up going to the wedding of the servant and then heading back to to Holyrood, I think. So she's out in the castle. She's staying there because it's closer to where the wedding is. But she had stopped in to check on her husband before she left. So she's there, and then in the middle of the night like a crack, a massive sound, like shudders through Edinburgh. Like everybody hears it. And there are these 11 men that are seen by like three separate witnesses just sort of running through, talking about traitors and whatnot. And as it turns out, so Mary wakes up and she freaks out because she is convinced the castle's under attack, which of course, there's a loud explosion You're convinced it's, you know, cannons and whatnot. So she's awoken and she's told that Kirkerfield, the provost house at Kirkerfield, is gone. It's disappeared. Now, the exact location of where this is, we're not sure. Uh, There's debate ever since people were, like, digging up Cowgate and figuring out things. Um, Archaeologists are sort of disputing the exact location. But we know it's in the heart of Edinburgh. We know that much. And so the house, smithereens. It's blown to pieces. It's fucking rubble. But what's weird is that Lord Darnley, the king, the king consort of Scotland, wasn't in sight. Like, he wasn't in the building when it exploded. His body was found a little while away between the house and an orchard, his body is found on the ground. He's in a nightshirt. And so is his valet. So he and his valet are both in their nightshirts, on the ground, apparently strangled. So what had happened? Now, people are really suspicious of Mary because when she found out that her husband was ill, she arranged for a letter to bring him back. So she'd gone, got him, got the letter, brought him back from Glasgow to Edinburgh. And she was taking care of him. Which, considering their tempestuous relationship, is a wee bit out of character. And what else is that? He's in this house. He's in the upper floor of the provost's house in Kirkafields. And while he's been there resting... And, you know, trying to regain strength or whatever. Maybe she's trying to keep an eye on him for whatever reason. 
but he's there bedridden. And while he's there, people had been filling the cellars of the house with gunpowder. Like, what is it? What is it with people and gunpowder and cellars? And at two o'clock in the morning on the 10th of February, 1567, kaboom, tire house, smithereens. Now, nothing left. Everyone agrees there was nothing left. Like, there was enough gunpowder in here to destroy an entire building. And so, Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley, him and his valet, they're beside a pear tree. They're in their night shirts. Their arses are hanging out. And there's a dagger between them. But neither of them have been stabbed, right? No stabbing. So, they believe that they heard something happen. They woke up in the middle of the night and they're suspicious. Now remember, these are 11 men running through the streets of Edinburgh that they think were involved in the plot. So these 11 men ran around. Clearly made some noise. I mean, yeah. Wake up Lord Darnley and he and his groom, his valet, they escape through a window because they're at the top floor of the house. So they think they either climbed out like on a chair or on a rope, but they were noticed. So as they leave, they get strangled and just left and left in their nightgowns. Just because they're so disrespected, they want them to see them. Now, it's kind of implied that they were left together to sort of imply a sort of homosexual relationship. Now, there are there are stories that the man was bisexual, but being a member of the LGBT community does not automatically make you an arsehole. This man just happened to be one. And so they believe that the explosion was like the intended like murder. Like it was intended to be, you know, the way of it. Because, you know, there's enough gunpowder to destroy a house. But they manage to get out and flee and escape. And that fucks things up a wee bit. So they kill them very quickly and easily. But the question is, were they killed before the explosion or after the explosion? Like, we won't know. Like, I think the initial plan was to, like, kill them and then just, like, blow the house up. Or they thought by blowing the house up, you know, they would kill him anyway. But they weren't, like, expecting him to escape. So, like, another theory is that he was on the loo, like, because he had so many issues, because he was so ill that he had diarrhoea, and that he was on the loo, and that was how he managed to escape. But they had chamber pots, so, like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But people start getting really suspicious, and the first person, I mean, the, it's like a who's who of Scottish nobility, like, the prime suspects of this, and it gets a bit weird. Because, like, the first person they blame is Mary. Because they accuse Mary of conspiring and that this Craig Miller castle meaning they had led to this. That she was involved in it. But the main theory, actually, now, at the time they blame Mary and it was a use for her downfall, basically. Because when she ends up marrying Bothwell, who was the main conspirator, who, if he wasn't directly involved in the plot he was at least adjacent to it. Like, he was attached somehow. And it was like the Earl of Moray and things like that, all these Protestant lords that wanted to get back at, well, him for being a dick and double-crossing them. And others just didn't like him because either way, he was bad for Scottish nobility. Like, he wasn't on anybody's side. He was on his own side. And that wasn't really approved of. And so... When he dies. But Mary, she gets a lot of the blame. See, rumours start swirling that she was behind it, right? Which, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to me because why would she do that when she she knows she could be implicated? Because she's trying to keep Elizabeth Tudor sweet because she wants her to name her as, you know, next in the line of succession. Or is she so convinced that she's right that she does it anyway? So the prevailing theory is that 
Moray and the other Protestant lords, with Bothwell, were involved in this plot. And while Mary's supposed to be doing this 40 days of mourning, she ends up ha being sent to like the seaside. She gets sent away. And this is seen as sort of her not really mourning the death of her husband. And yeah, so this gets to the point where she ends up marrying Bothwell. Like, pretty soon after the death of her second husband, she marries this dude. Basically, he is sent to trial. Like, she organises a trial in the Privy Council. Basically says he's not guilty. They're like, nope, wasn't him. Uh-uh. So the whole plan was apparently to just get him out of the way, get Bothwell in and have him take control of Mary and have it that way. So when Mary and Bothwell get married, this just pisses off Elizabeth because now she's convinced that Mary was involved in this. And when she marries Bothwell, it, it doesn't bode well for her. People just think it's too soon and that this clearly means that she was fucking things up. But the thing is, Mary was kidnapped and assaulted by Bothwell. And so in order to preserve her honour, she has to marry him. But like, the death of Lord Darnley, it leads to all of these issues and eventually turns both Scotland and England against her to the point where, like, it's the reason that Elizabeth puts her in captivity. It's the reason she ends up imprisoned for like 20 years. And it caused her downfall. And like Lord Darnley, Henry Stewart, he's an absolute prick, but he was like 21 at the time. Like he's young. He's young and and he was probably gonna die of syphilis anyway. Like it it feels like an unnecessary death because he was gonna go. Like he was very, very ill. And they were, like, keeping an eye on him. So what was there to gain for Mary by killing him in this convoluted way? Like, what was there to gain? When they could have just waited, they could have poisoned him. He already had syphilis. Like, he, he was not doing well. Why would his death have to happen by explosion? Like, and, and what... What the weird thing is, is that like he had to have died after the explosion. Because otherwise, why wouldn't they just put his body in the building and then blow it up? Like, why would they... Why would they fuck around? It doesn't make sense. It's just weird. It's weird and it bothers me and I had to share it with all of you. And that's why it's a bitty sword. Because it's just... I just had to talk about it. Um, but if you like this bitty sword, feel free to rate and review five stars. It would be great if you did. Uh... Uh, it's just been it's been a bit of a week and I really wanted to tell this story to you and I wanted to share it and I know it's just a wee bit extra and I hope you enjoy it and I can't wait for you to hear next week's episode because I have gone back into a bit of true crime but it's from the 1800s and it involves a doctor, his wife and and the saltiest jury I have ever read in my life. These these men are just <laughs> I'm gonna reenact some of it for you in the actual episode because it's too good. It's my favourite thing. I cannot do the accents though. I make it help on that. I hope you all have a great weekend and I can't wait to release Tuesday's episode for you. And I'm gonna do my best to bring back the Betty Swords. They might only come like every fortnight, every two weeks. Uh, just well, I try and get stuff done because I'm trying to work on Patreon stuff. I just released the new Patreon merch and also a bonus discount for Patreon users. So hopefully that will work out well for everybody. And then I have uh, I have a I have a bedtime story coming up on Patreon. I just need to edit it and actually get it up. So that's coming. The who done it what now? I'm also trying to work on doing live shows and getting some tours sorted, but I genuinely don't know where to start. So if anybody has any uh, thoughts or recommendations, feel free to feel free to message me. Uh, the email is the email's down below. But anyway, I will chat to you next time. 
Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.